At the end of the 13th century, the most powerful monarch in Europe is King Philip IV of France. He had manipulated Pope Celestine into siphoning him church money and land. But after Celestine's resignation, the new Pope, Boniface VIII, is not so easily manipulated. When Boniface VIII became Pope, he saw the French influence as something that had gone way, way out of bounds. And so he positioned himself essentially as the anti-France Pope. So Philip IV and Boniface had these very real clash of powers. Boniface began to generate some very, very harsh language about the power of the papacy. Here is a letter that he wrote to Philip IV of France. He said, listen, son. Literally, that's how he begins it. Son, God has set us over kings and kingdoms. Let no one persuade you that you have superiority. So it is this very explicit language that says the Pope has control over the king. But King Philip has an agenda, and he does not intend to let one insubordinate pope stand in his way. After the resignation of his puppet pope, Celestine V, in 1294, King Philip IV of France is determined to reassert his power over the papacy. But the new Pope, Boniface VIII, refuses to give in to the greedy monarch. Philip IV comes to the throne at a time in which warfare is fought by purchasing armies. And uh, he, like other monarchs, needs more and more money. And the church is very wealthy. So when Boniface dies, King Philip ensures that a Pope who will give him what he wants is elected. He expressed very clearly to the College of Cardinals that he preferred this particular French candidate. It wasn't an easy election. But ultimately, the French side was strong enough to win. A French prelate who takes the name Clement V becomes the Pope. Philip actually asks them to come to France to crown him Pope. The popes, of course, had been appointed in Rome from the time of St. Peter. King Philip of France has a very powerful hold on Pope Clement V. This is a weak man, and he's intimidated by Philip. Clement's just notorious. He just did whatever he was asked. Clement V actually promised Philip a flat-out portion of the church tithe. That It just went straight into the royal coffers. He also signed off on the expulsion of Jews as a danger to the church, in knowledge that the wealth was going to go to Philip. That's very blatant. By 1309, King Philip has turned Pope Clement V into a pawn of the French crown. And in an attempt to solidify his power over the church, the French king lays the groundwork for what will be the papacy's most notorious resignation by undermining its very foundation. Peter is buried on the Vatican Hill and St. Peter's Basilica is built over his tomb. Popes are seen as inheriting that charisma and that role, standing in for the apostle. His tomb is the foundation charter for the papacy. But King Philip demands that Pope Clement leave the legacy of St. Peter in Rome and move the papacy to operate under his thumb in France. The Pope eventually will end up setting up quarters at Avignon. Rather than being in a landscape where the Pope could actually act as an independent power and make alliances with anyone that he chose, he was now firmly entrenched in one country, clearly under the control of one king. That was what warped the papacy. It's a little bit as though Washington, D.C. suddenly upped and said, well, now Manhattan is going to be the capital of the entire United States. 
For the first time since the invention of the conclave, the one with true power over the church is not the one chosen by God, but a power-hungry monarch instead. It's the dream of all the great rulers of medieval Europe to control the papacy. Philip actually got the papacy into France. Once you've done that, the Pope can become a puppet of what you want to get done. That is a moment for the church that becomes very troubling. You're abdicating the seat of where the church is supposed to lie. If you leave the bones of Peter behind and you're not moving them, you're moving to this other place. What you're saying is, is that maybe this isn't as important to the church as we have thought it was previously. And that becomes a really dangerous situation for holding together not just the papacy, but holding together beliefs and tenets of the church. Leaving Rome costs the papacy its religious authority throughout Europe. But once the church becomes established in France, Pope Clement V finds that, despite being hundreds of miles from the bones of St. Peter, there are certain benefits to the new location. It was very clearly a time when they had given up their spiritual authority um, in order to enjoy material prosperity. The College of Cardinals, which also became centered at Avignon after this, was absolutely notorious for luxurious living and for having banquets that went on for days and for spending church money in order to take care of themselves. But the Avignon papacy worked. It's in southern France. It's much more central to Europe than the Italian peninsula. It was efficient. It had a decent bureaucracy. There's actually a good case for the Avignon papacy. Big problem, though. It doesn't have the tomb of Peter. And what's the point of a pope who doesn't sit at the tomb of Peter? Despite being miles from the spiritual foundation of the papacy, Pope Clement V remains in France and continues to lead the church under King Philip until they both die in 1314. His successor continues his papacy in Avignon, as does the Pope after him. The papacy was more or less captured by the King of France. For a long period of time, it was completely the instrument of the French crown, and almost every cardinal who was appointed to the College of Cardinals during this time was French. By 1347, it appears that the papacy has become an arm of the French crown for good. In the mid-1360s, the papacy has left Rome and been operating in Avignon, France for almost 60 years. At this point, the cardinals are almost all French and have become accustomed to the luxurious lifestyle afforded to them as a thank you for the church's loyalty to the French crown. But outside the walls of the lush papal castle, the rest of Europe is a wasteland setting the stage for what will be the last papal resignation for 600 years. The Black Death, this contagious, dreadful disease, devastated Europe. Pretty much the entire population was wiped out. In the wake of the plague, the papacy is forced to reevaluate its role in Europe and face dire conditions in the city it abandoned. With the absence of the papacy from Rome, the upkeep of the city began to fail. A great deal of the upkeep of Rome came out of the Pope's coffers. Now this was all going to France. Law and order became very, very shaky. You have a rise in pickpockets and muggings because there's no king in Rome, there's no emperor in Rome, and now there's no pope in Rome. The Romans learned somewhat reluctantly that uh, the city depended on the presence of the papacy to flourish to become anything more than just a, a bit of a wreck. Fed up with the sheltered confines of Avignon, Pope Urban V decides that the papacy has lost sight of its spiritual purpose and must return to the bones of St. Peter in Rome.
Urban V, a reform-minded pope, is appalled by the luxury. He was appalled by the self-indulgence. In Avignon, he announced to the cardinals that they could only have one course at dinner rather than their usual 10-course banquet. And it had increasingly become clear that as long as the papacy was tied to the fortunes of any country, that the ability to act as a spiritual leader would be seriously compromised. He was convicted that the papacy needed to return to its home in Rome. But it was not an easy transition. The cardinals, who had become used to their indulgent lifestyle in Avignon, did not appreciate the rundown conditions in the fallen city. But Pope Urban V and his successor, another Frenchman, Gregory XI, remained firm in their spiritual conviction that the papacy belongs at the tomb of St. Peter. There is a lot of resentment about their having to sort of come down in the world, which I think just shows what a cushioned, isolated existence they were living in Avignon. That you have a Europe that's been devastated by the plague. Um, that the entire social structure of Europe has changed, that in some places 90% of the population has died. But the primary concern of the College of Cardinals is that they're not getting enough courses for dinner. So you definitely have a sense in which during the Avignon papacy, it has gotten so out of touch with what the church is supposed to be doing. When Pope Gregory XI dies in 1378, many of the cardinals prepare to move back to Avignon but the frustrated Romans call for a sign that the papacy has freed itself from the French crown and will return to the principles of the church they once knew. The Roman population, who were always very volatile and who regularly intervened in papal elections, after a long string of French popes, were determined to have an Italian pope. The conclave of 1378 is met with angry mobs of Romans chanting outside the Vatican, demanding a renewed papal investment in their beloved city. And though the cardinals miss their extravagant French lifestyle, they worry what might happen if the Romans' demands are not met. And so an Italian pope. Urban VI was elected. But he seems to have been unhinged by becoming the Pope. Instantly, he reveals himself to be a megalomaniac, locking up people who didn't agree with him. So instead of being a unifying figure, he becomes a symbol of division. Half of the Cardinals stand behind the maniacal Pope Urban VI in Rome, while the other half panic and flee back to Avignon, where they elect another Pope. Clement VII. The once universal church is now split. Catholics are torn between two different popes, running two functioning church bureaucracies from two different places. There was an election of a pope, and some people didn't like that election, so some people say, we're gonna set up a church someplace else. And so this becomes a very big battle. So in solving one problem, getting the Pope back to Rome, you've created a much worse one. We went through a long period when there were always at least two different people claiming to be Pope. This unprecedented break in the church is what Catholics refer to as the Western Schism. You've got popes saying, I am Pope. Uh, and some popes are classed as anti-popes because other people don't recognize them. But who is the anti-pope? Who's the real pope? For nearly 40 years, the church is divided. And Catholics are forced to choose the true heir to St. Peter's legacy. Where is the place that we are centered? That needs to flow from the pope. What do you do if you have two popes? Then it becomes a real problem for the church and you've got to sort that out. This schism made a mockery of the whole idea of the Pope and the Vicar of Christ being the successor of Peter. If there is one Saint Peter, he can only have one legacy held by only one man. Two popes become a clear sign that the spiritual source of papal power has been abandoned.
Having two popes is impossible. It's shattering for Christendom. Reformers say, we've got to do something about this. With the future of the church hanging in the balance, in 1415, cardinals on both sides look for a solution. They convene a general council at Constance, and the popes involved are summoned and either deposed or invited to resign. Both the Roman Pope Gregory XII and the Avignon Pope Benedict XII are forced to resign. In 1415, Pope Gregory XII will be the last Pope to leave the office alive until 2013, when Pope Benedict XVI makes a shocking announcement. last time a pope resigned happened just about 600 years ago. That would be Pope Gregory XII back in 1415. Throughout the history of the Catholic Church, only four popes have ever resigned. And Pope Benedict XVI is the only one who has ever done it peacefully and of his own volition. But what does it mean to have two living popes? How can two men hold one legacy of St. Peter? Everyone was surprised. Catholics were surprised, non-Catholics were surprised. It was a strong contrast to John Paul II, who insisted on remaining Pope until his dying gasp. In 2005, after reigning for 27 years, Pope John Paul II passed away after a long and public battle with Parkinson's disease. In a way, the act of resignation was a devastating comment on the last five or six years of his predecessor. A flight in the face of the whole theology of the papacy as it had evolved in modern times. The notion that John Paul had propagated that the papacy was a cross which was laid on your shoulders and you could not shake it off. Benedict said, well, it's a job, and if you can't do it, you should let somebody else try. By resigning in the face of old age, Pope Benedict XVI has made a clear statement about the divinity of the papal office. I think that was a reminder to everybody in any position of authority or power, it's not just about me. It's actually about, am I being effective Am I really serving the community and serving the church properly? What Benedict did in resigning was to make it easier for successive popes to be able to say, I'm 80 years old, I'm not gonna stay until I fall down dead in this office. That's thinking more like a CEO than anything else. Alighting from the helicopter, Francis thanks the pilots, then seeing his predecessor goes toward him to embrace him. This is a historic moment. There's not any kind of precedent. For Benedict's resignation, who really did do it voluntarily and off his own bat. Today, Pope Benedict XVI lives in a quiet apartment in the Vatican. He has passed the Holy Office peacefully down to Pope Francis leaving the power struggles of the past behind. The biggest gift that ever happened to the papacy is Pope Benedict XVI resigning because he allowed the papacy not to become a trap. In terms of looking to the future, as any pope begins to get older or begins to have any difficulties, the question of resignation will be on the horizon. Francis has also talked about resigning, and one you don't know how serious he is. He's a mischievous man, and he's got an agenda, and he's an old man, and I think he'll want to see that agenda out first. But it may be that he has learnt the lesson of watching John Paul II collapse into helplessness. It would be very interesting if popes now said, right, I've done my bit, someone else can have a go. 
In announcing his voluntary retirement, Pope Benedict has shaken the foundation of the papacy. If Pope Francis retires as well, a 2,000-year-old institution could be fundamentally changed forever.